Okay, a very warm welcome to everybody to today's joint workshop by the Research Institute CoCAPT and the Bayreuth International Summer School. Um, this workshop is also at the same time a preview for this summer's Bayreuth International Summer School, which is now uh, open for registration if anybody's interested, which we of course hope. Um, our distinguished speaker today does really need no introduction. Professor Jean Duplessis, I hope I pronounced that correctly now, right. um, from Deakin University in Melbourne is well known for his excellent work on corporate law and corporate governance. We are both honored and delighted to have him as our speaker today. The topic of Professor Duplessis' presentation delves right into the ongoing heated debate on contemporary corporate governance perspectives, reporting on non-financial matters and the rise and fall of shareholder primacy. If you have any questions, please write them into the chat and Professor Duplessis will answer them after his presentation. Now, I am very excited to hear whether we are really nearing the end of shareholder primacy and I give the floor to Professor Duplessis. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Uh, I first of all would like to say that I'm really very excited about the opportunity once again uh, to, prevent, uh, to present a workshop for you. We had one uh, last year and I also had uh, three other public uh, lectures and Zoom meetings uh, basically on the same theme. Uh, generally, as you would know, my area of specialization is corporate governance and corporate law. And that's why I'm very excited to participate in uh, this uh, particular uh, workshop once again. Um, I do have a message uh, for my colleagues and friends in Australia and in New Zealand. Uh, I would be very disappointed as it is now about eight o'clock, just after eight. I will be very disappointed if you haven't got something to drink in your hand. Uh, and if you don't sit back in a relaxed mode and perhaps even have a nice snack or dinner next to you and then just relax and listen to me. So I'll be very disappointed if you do not do that. Uh, for my colleagues in other jurisdictions, I also have a uh, message and that is, well, it's probably uh, too early to start to drink now. Uh, I wouldn't encourage that. That would be irresponsible for me. And I believe in responsible corporate governance and uh, promote responsible practices. So don't start to drink now. But I think by the time I'm finished, it will be roughly lunchtime. And I expect that you would like to have something to drink by then uh, to overcome the shock uh, of what I have to say in my presentation. Uh, so with uh, that light note, uh, I just want to finish my introduction with a little bit more sober observation. I think most of you will know that here in Melbourne, we are going into uh, stage four lockdown from 12 o'clock uh, today. Uh, it's very sad, especially with Australian Open, and uh, uh, we've been in hard lockdown before. Uh, I am pleased that uh, we do uh, deal with these things very, very severely and strictly, but it is, uh, as you all would know in the whole world, this thing really got to all of us and hopefully we will overcome it. So um, uh, let me just quickly tell you what I'm going to share with you today. First of all, I will concentrate on the, uh, or give a little bit of context to the topic. And I would just once again, I've done this before, just uh, emphasize the significance and impact of limited liability company the LTD PTY Limited, uh, as we most know them with various other abbreviations as well. Uh, and then I would in part two like to focus on uh, the shift to from a shareholder primacy uh, to an all-inclusive stakeholder approach to corporate governance. Uh, in uh, part three, I know there are quite a few of my friends and colleagues very respected and high profile that would be very interested in my comments from a legal point of view on this issue uh, as it's not always seen as a strictly legal aspect and then finally i would like to make a few concluding remarks uh, don't be misled or be deceived by the three headings only uh, I think my presentation will be very close to an hour and uh, I've been trying to do my best to make it interesting, visual and pictorial uh, as I normally try to do. Well, first of all, the context and significance of the uh, topic, the limited liability company. 
uh, many of you, especially the informed ones from a legal point of view, would know since 1855, when limited liability became the norm, this abbreviation, LTD, PDY Limited, was supposed to be the red flag. You are now dealing with a, a company as a separate legal entity. And remember, uh, the shareholders are no longer limit, uh, liable to an unlimited extent. You need to be careful as creditors uh, because you are dealing with a corporate as a separate legal entity. And you wouldn't be able, if things go wrong, to go and knock on the doors of all the shareholders as you could do in the past. Uh, so serious warning signals supposed to have been given by the abbreviations there. But it didn't take long before this uh, red uh, flag turned for many into pots of gold. Wonderful profits that's been made and many gained from it. But I wish I could stop there. I wish I could say that's the whole picture. But for millions or even billions, this limited liability company also put them in a cage and billions and millions of people suffered through uh, this absolutely fantastic, wonderful institution, the Limited Liability Corporation that's been described by Nicholas Murray Butler, the president of Columbia University as the greatest single discovery of modern times already in 1911. And uh, many years later, very respected professor, Professor Len Seeley of Cambridge commented on that. And he said, well, in actual fact, it seems as if it's a claim that cannot be substantiated. But if you think about the development, even steam and electricity and all the other older inventions would not have been possible if it wasn't for the uh, introduction of the limited liability through which progress could be advanced. So a very bright and wonderful picture uh, that we have there. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the ugly side of uh, COVID-9 or the ugly side of the corporations uh, was exposed very, very clearly by the COVID-19 uh, uh, crisis. Uh, this is a picture that my now uh, uh, daughter-in-law took in about uh, 2013 in Berlin. And the context, of course, at that stage was not COVID-19 at all. But I just like the image. I cannot stop looking at the image. And it's so appropriate, not only when the Berlin Wall was still there, but it's so appropriate for the suffering that the corporation caused to many individuals. It's also so absolutely stunningly true about what we experience now with COVID-19 the lockdown image. Uh, Jessica can see things quite often that uh, me and my family can't see. And I'm so glad that she could pick on this particular image that I use often. I don't need to uh, inform you about all the bad stuff that happened with corporations and through the limited liability corporation. I mean, you all are very much aware of this. You've lived through it. Some of you experienced this. Some of you have been part of it. Some of you have opposed it. Some of you have in actual fact enjoyed the benefits, but many others have unfortunately suffered through this invention, the biggest invention of all times. And then of course, uh, the bad and the ugly side of the corporation was so well uh, illustrated uh, by uh, the corporation by Joel Bakken uh, and the documentary of it. It's a little bit long, as I've mentioned in the past, but I mean, anybody interested in corporate law who did not uh, watch it, uh, really, uh, you wouldn't have any clue of the true nature of this beast, so to call it. Uh, I'm not a doom prophet. Uh, I uh, will show you that I am very much aware that there are many advantages of it. But the bad and the ugly side here in Australia was also exposed by the uh, Hain com uh, Commission uh, regarding the, uh, uh, the Royal Commission into the Conduct in Banking, Superannuation and Financial Services Industry. Uh, I, I really always thought this was the most incredibly brave move for a country to have that, this sort of commission into their banking and financial systems uh, uh, such, uh, institutions. Uh, I mean, we all expected that a can of, can of worms would have been opened 
And uh, this commission did open a can of worms. There were massive legal uh, reforms and there are still uh, ramifications and new legislation that's coming in as recently as last week, a new about 387 page uh, piece of legislation with a very extensive memorandum or explanatory memorandum became a law. And well, uh, I think most of you would have seen in the news of our latest problem, corporate arrogance uh, with the Crown Casino uh, and all the heroes or people that's been called heroes now busy tumbling down from very, very high and golden mountains. A person now that's not uh, supposed to be holding a gambling license, not fit and proper, and uh, the bad corporate governance uh, or bad uh, corporate culture that's been uh, exposed uh, in the financial sector, here we have the tip of the iceberg regarding other corporations as well. And I am just really surprised and I will not be surprised if same commission investigations are done in other sectors in Australia as well. We are incredibly good here in Australia with commissions. With that and uh, changing our prime ministers, that's one of the hobbies that we have here. We are very good with it. Whether it's bushfires or whether it's a, a, a tsunami or whether it's banking or whether it's this particular thing or co collapses of corporations, we love our commissions or our Royal Commissions. And I would not be surprised if there's another Royal Commission into this. So uh, another two or 3,000 uh, page uh, report will come out, I would expect after this has become a commission investigation. So, uh, to make an anal uh, analogy of which you are very much familiar over the recent uh, eight months or so, I think that nowadays the empl employees can also say worldwide, irrespective of color, belief, uh, or uh, creed, that we can't breathe uh, because of the smothered, uh, because we are smothered by shareholder greed, based on uh, the, uh, the the profits that are paid primarily to pay dividends to shareholders, to pump more cash into the pockets of shareholders by buying its own share back uh, or buy their own shares back from their uh, own shareholders. And then of course the pay to pay uh, excessive remuneration and bonuses to executive directors. Let me assure you, I'm not a socialist. I'm not a socialist and I'll show you that, uh, but I think I am a realistic capitalist. And I think this is the trend for us nowadays to re-evaluate the value of capitalism. And I know uh, the person that I've got very high respect for, uh, Professor Mervyn King, who is also participating. Uh, uh, we are very much on the same page and my thoughts have been uh, influenced by him on numerous occasions. And uh, I think uh, I will explain to you what the broader picture is about capitalism nowadays. Now, most of you will know Andy Haldane, um, and LD Haldane, uh, who was then the chief economist of the Bank of England uh, in 2014, considered to be one of the seven, so a young man, so to speak, if you take into consideration my age and some others that I know are in actual fact listening. He said that uh, and pointed out that in 1970, uh, of all the company profits, about 90% uh, went back into reinvestment into the company. That changed considerably. And in 2015, he made a sort of a guess that about only 25 uh, or uh, of the total amount of profits, 65% went to dividends and shareholders and only 35% to shareholders. Now, this is not what Andy Haldane said, but if you follow the uh, trend there, uh, I would probably predict that we are sitting at 75, 25%. So shareholders taking what they think they deserve. I'm not saying that they not, but, uh, if you compare uh, the years there, 1970, now, uh, 2015 and 2019, it's sort of a disturbing sort of picture that you see there. 
uh, and I'll show you uh, how uh, COVID-19 exposed the problems. Spend a few minutes looking at this particular graph. I, I really like it um, because it's very clearly illustrating uh, the red line there or the pink line is the capital expenditure. At one stage here, about 2000, it's been higher than both dividend payments, the light blue and share buybacks. But see what happened later on in from about uh, 2015. Uh, and this trend of course continued uh, for a while and it's still continuing. If it wasn't for COVID-19 uh, and the fact that a stop has been made, put uh, to uh, share buybacks and dividend payments by legislation in certain jurisdictions, this trend would have uh, continued. Exactly the same illustration here. Uh, so there you have the S&P 500 index in green and then record share buybacks, pumping back cash into the pockets of shareholders. Um, so uh, here is a good illustration of the percentages, uh, quite a recent 1919 analysis of how much of company profits went to shareholders, how much went to, into job creations, how much into workers, production customers and the communities. Now, let me say to you, I am not on the same page as a person as Bernie Sanders. Uh, as I said, I'm not a socialist and I do not want to take the principles of socialism uh, too far. Uh, but uh, if he says, uh, or if he's got the facts right, and he would say that between, and of course, uh, Chuck uh, Schumer as well, that between 2008 and 2017, 466 of the S&P 500 companies spent around 4 trillion on stock buybacks equal to 53% of profits. Another 30% of corporate profits went to dividends. When more than 80% of the corporate profits go to buybacks and dividends, there is reason to be concerned. <laughs> irrespective of you agree or disagree with his political views and his view of a corporation, I think we must realize there's a problem. So here is the picture in Australia. I had two brilliant uh, research assistants over the last two years uh, that did some research for me uh, using financial statements of the ASX 50 to just see what our companies here in Australia paid out uh, as dividends uh, and remuneration of directors and share buyback. So that first little thing in the pie chart is the amount that's been paid uh, to executives as remuneration. So this is the thing that catch the eye of the public. Wow, excessive uh, remuneration of directors. What a terrible evil. This is something that we need to stop. They, we should have a say on pay as the shareholders. In the meantime, uh, grabbing 75% uh, of company profits. Uh, so in this case, uh, you will see that's the percentage that went into dividends that's been paid from profits. And then sharebacks took up that amount. Now, I've seen many politicians struggled with uh, if you don't uh, show the numbers in words, but you just give the numbers. But see, director's remuneration, 722 million, all right? So now we are into the millions. When you get to share buybacks, we go into the billions, 15 billion, 530 million. All right, and then if you get to dividends that's been paid, you get into the trillions. Is something wrong? Is this just something that we need to accept? Did COVID-19 teach a lesson, uh, lesson to us? What happened to the rest? Where's the remaining part? What happened to it? Did other people suffer as a consequence of this greed of shareholders? Uh, I leave the question open to you. And then I just want to ask the question, is it, uh, surprising to you that employees are up in arms? Is it surprising to you that the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Delaware, previously Justice Liu Strine, would now actively promote the interest of employees and show how important they are? A person that I'm sure will not be considered to be a socialist, but a person who cares and who's got a very deep insight in corporate law issues is no longer 
a, a, a judge, but he's working at a large law firm uh, looking after the interests of employees and uh, 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 workers. So I think that in summary, I could say that it is beyond dispute that the shareholder centric corporate law model created enormous prosperity and wealth for some countries and some individuals. But at the same time, this model caused immeasurable harm to the environment, many human beings, most societies, and many other creatures currently stuck on planet Earth. I emphasize currently because if we see how things are going up to other planets, perhaps there's an intentional uh, effort to destroy this planet so that people can make money sending people to other planets. But uh, well, uh, of course, many of the things that I will say will also be tongue in cheek. Uh, what should or could be done to address the problem? I think uh, one of the issues is uh, a legal shift from shareholder primacy to all an all-inclusive stakeholder approach. So uh, just to give you uh, some perspective of terminology, uh, the pure capitalism model, of course, is the one uh, attributed to Milton Friedman. Everybody knows that. But uh, you will see that uh, Professor Mervyn King in a very interesting paper recently said, uh, that we should not always refer to share or uh, shareholder or stakeholder uh, uh, primacy. We should distinguish some of the terminology. Uh, the person who's uh, known as one of the first who started with a more theoretical uh, uh, basis of the stakeholder uh, theory or pluralistic theory is Edward Friedman and of course currently Bernie uh, Sanders. I'm not on their page because I think that they try to treat all uh, uh, stakeholders too much equally and the interests of them vary depending on uh, what the best interest of the corporation is. I'll explain that to you in my final slide. And then of course an all-inclusive shareholder model is the one that I think is uh, the uh, one that we need to strive for uh, and it is something the concept of inclusive capitalism that I would promote uh, promote very strongly and I know uh, other people's doing this as well you need to see the corporation as a separate legal entity and within that entity entity as I will show in my final slide various other interests are in actual fact uh, presented I've written a few papers on this of course it had no impact and will probably never have any impact uh, the sources or the forces uh, that's uh, gaining from uh, this particular uh, system and the political forces are absolutely far, 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 far too powerful to even listen to a uh, ordinary professor uh, sitting at Deakin University in a uh, university in down under living in Geelong. So uh, I don't think that I will have any impact, but in any case, it's interesting to just illustrate that I've been thinking about this uh, particular thing uh, uh, for quite a while. I've mentioned the name uh, Freeman uh, 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 in regards to stakeholder primacy. Uh, the people who I really admire, and I think Patty Island can in actual fact be said to be the first one who exposed this absolute myth of the shareholders being uh, the owners of the corporation. And in an in-depth analysis of the history from partnerships, uh, right through to the joint stock company, to the modern uh, corporation. He illustrates absolutely fantastically uh, why shareholders cannot be seen as the owners of the corporation. And then of course, uh, I think most of you will know Paul Hawkins is the College of Commerce. Uh, very, very uh, uh, excellent book as well. But but most one of the most recent ones, I only got my copy in December last year, is one by Alex Edmonds, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. And once again, I cannot help to refer to Andy Haldane and his praise of this book. And I think this will say everything. I do not know whether capitalism is in crisis, uh, uh, Haldane says, but I do know Alex uh, Edmonds, super per book makes the, the case compellingly and comprehensively for a radical rethink of how companies operate and indeed why they exist. It is the definitive account of the analytic, uh, analytical case for responsible business, but is at the same time practical and grounded in legal business experience. It is a tour de force.
So uh, very high praise and uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading through the book and seeing how there are different uh, ways in which you can uh, deal with the current model. Nobody knowing stakeholder debate will not know about uh, Lynn Stout. She passed away on the 20th of April uh, 2018, uh, but she made a massive contribution to corporate uh, law and corporate governance. Uh, some people uh, would uh, try and discredit her work, uh, especially academics, but you know, they say there's somebody who said that uh, in academics, the fighting is so fierce because the stakes are so pitifully low. Um, so, uh, in this uh, regard, I think some of those who criticize her should uh, think uh, twice. Uh, she had a massive impact and there was a uh, tribute to her in this very recent volume uh, of this journal and uh, very, very, very well respected ac uh, academics. But the two papers that I think uh, would illustrate the problem or in actual fact, what we are dealing with here is the paper by uh, Jean Philippe Robey, uh, the shareholder value mess and how to clean it up. And then a person that uh, I really have had dealings with for many years, Professor Thomas Clark. Uh, I would consider Thomas to be a good friend here in Australia. And he's wrote a very, very good paper. He's written many others on this topic as well. Uh, the contest on corporate purpose, why Lynn Stout was right and Milton Friedman was wrong. Uh, so I think all of you would now uh, immediately try and do a search to find this paper. Uh, uh, three other books that I just want to draw your attention to uh, in the area that I find very uh, uh, exciting and interesting is the one by a very famous person, Joseph uh, Stiglitz, as you would know, uh, Richard Wolff, and uh, very recently as well, uh, I also got the copy on the end of December, Christopher May, regarding the research uh, agenda for corporate relations law, and in the final chapter, trying to spell out some alternatives. So, uh, moving away from shareholder primacy to an all-inclusive stakeholder approach was important long before uh, COVID-19. And here again, I would like to mention the name of Professor Mervyn King. He brought out the, uh, uh, the King One report in 1994. And uh, I am reasonably convinced, not convinced, uh, I know that he's been the first person who promoted this idea of all inclusive stakeholders very actively in that report because he realized that you can't see, as he always put it so well, in silos. You need to look at the corporation uh, in, ho in an, a holistic uh, way. And he's done that uh, very well and refined his ideas uh, in the various other King reports uh, up to 2016. Uh, I'm really sorry to say, but uh, the, 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 the unfortunate thing is I think a problem that South Africa has got, it's got a Rolls Royce corporate governance model, but unfortunately, uh, the terrain is that of the Dakar rally. So I don't think that always that absolutely Rolls Royce would uh, handle the circumstances and the conditions of uh, what's happening in South Africa. And I'm not talking about COVID-19. I'm talking about names like Zuma, the Guptas, the Stellenbosch, uh, Mafia, the PE Mafia, uh, and and I, I will stop there, it's a different topic. Uh, and then of course also Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, started very actively to move away from the strict shareholder primacy model. And then all of you would know of the business roundtable statement. Uh, I think it's worth repeating what they said. They started to uh, focus on other cust uh, on other stakeholders, customers, employees, suppliers, um, and the communities, uh, and of course the shareholders. And I've added this part, the parts in yellow. So the customers who generate business and allow for profit making, the employees who manufacture goods and provide services to the company, uh, the suppliers who supply goods and services to the company, uh, uh, the, uh, and the uh, communities uh, which, uh, which we work and can severely be impacted by corporations. And then of course the shareholders, you can never ever ignore the importance of shareholders who provide the capital that allows companies to invest, grow, and innovate. Uh, 
So uh, very important. Uh, I, they were immediately attack the uh, American round table or business round table by the council of institutional investors. It is to be expected. Uh, the business round table statement suggests corporate obligations to a variety of stakeholders, placing shareholders last. I don't think this is really what they meant by just putting them last. It was just a list of things. Uh, and re referencing shareholders simply as providers of capital rather than as owners. We know they are not owners. So why you need to uh, repeat something that is well established legally, I don't know. But even if they are right, so all good, just let the greatest simple discovery of modern times, the limited liability corporation and its owners, the shareholders, keep on destroying mankind and planet Earth and ignore the interests of all stakeholders. Uh, here I once again uh, refer to the brilliant mind of Liu Strine, who said in a really a good and succinct uh, uh, paper or piece in the New York Times in the 10th of April, far for far for too long, the stock market's power over economy has grown at the expense of other stakeholders, particularly workers. Finally, we must acknowledge this fact. So think about this. Waiting until a dark economic moment to give workers band-aids in a bailout bill is a poor substitute for giving them what they deserve in the first place. Uh, so uh, here are a few fundamental questions that I think we all need to uh, ask ourselves. Whether you are a, an employee, a worker, whether you are part of a community that's been affected, whether you are an academic uh, or whether you are a CEO or a corporate uh, a, a person involved in corporate business, uh, ask the question again and then ask whether it's right. Is the all-inclusive uh, stakeholder uh, approach standing on solid common law and statutory grounds? Unfortunately, I'm going to disappoint you. Is the all-inclusive stakeholder approach just a, a rhetoric? paying lip service to a dream and totally detached from hard corporate realities, a decoy to divert attention away from the far more fundamental flaws of our modern corporate law and corporate governance models. I have no doubt that in the US, the shareholder primacy model is absolutely, absolutely embedded, embedded very firmly legally. And I have uh, had arguments with my colleagues and they all admit that, well, no, Dutch is not really law because she, uh, directors can take into consideration other stakeholders and they do so, they say that they do so, but it's, the law says that a business corporation is organized and carried on primarily for the profit of the stockholders. The powers of directors are to be employed for that end. And if you think that Michigan, where that Dodge case was decided is a small jurisdiction, then please read the article by David Josephon. Uh, I will give you the reference if you want. He points out that that is exactly the approach of the Delaware courts as well. That is still very much embedded. What about the UK? I don't think there's any other better statutory uh, way in which the shareholder primacy model has been uh, confirmed through legislation in the UK by way of section 172. Very controversial section and uh, uh, meanings and uh, opinions differ tremendously uh, or tremendously uh, about it. Uh, where they started to uh, bring in elements of uh, a stakeholder approach, but there are just so much two fundamental trumps in the whole section, the benefit of its members as a whole, the company for the benefits of its members. So uh, I've got no hesitation to say that it's probably the best way uh, or the most uh, severe and specific way of it entrenching the shareholder primacy model uh, into uh, legislation. We don't have that in Australia. So I, uh, I think even though you will see, I say that we've got the shareholder primacy model, that is not in actual fact um, the, the, the law. Uh, so, but uh, even the British Academy who did a survey uh, highlighting the appetite for new definition of corporate purpose 
said that 44% of the respondents said the purpose of businesses of business is to maximize returns for shareholders owners within the confines of the law. Now, I would really like to see how that 44% is broken down. If that is uh, part of the 44%, if they are the largest and the most influential respondents and shareholders, then it's a massive number or very large number of people or individuals or people in power that still believes in profit maximization for shareholders. Yes, of course, everybody would say they believe in corporate social responsibility, but is that only lip service? Um, in Australia, uh, I have challenged uh, the uh, validity of uh, older cases which said that the best interest of the corporation means the best interest as the shareholders as a whole. Once again, I know uh, I've probably will not be listened to. Uh, it's not law. I've argued the case on various grounds. I've even argued recently for a, a duty of uh, corporate social de uh, responsibility ba based on community expectations. Uh, but I'm realistic and I've been realistic since 2016. And if you read that very short note, I conclude that uh, shareholder primacy is still very much embedded into the corporate corporations law in Australia. If you as directors can appoint the directors, if you can remove the directors, if you can adopt a, sh uh, a, a special res or take a special resolution and adopt a constitution, if you can change the constitution, you are in full control. And I mean, if you even uh, the directors who would have the power to declare dividends or initiate share buybacks. If you've got the control over the directors, you control the corporation and uh, whatever's ha going to happen eventually with the profits of a corporation. Uh, it's sad to look at this, uh, the images of COVID-19. Um, was COVID-19 the game changer? Uh, Milton Friedman said, and remember, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely think it's, it's just been one of the most brilliant people that ever lived on, on earth. Uh, but he said uh, in that it's only a crisis, actual or perceived, uh, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. And I think it's so true what we are experiencing at the moment. Uh, Larry Fink uh, made it very clear that uh, he tried to uh, steer CEOs to move away from the pure uh, shareholder focused uh, shareholder primacy model. Uh, and he emphasized the importance of climate change and that that will be the focus for him and uh, the companies in which uh, BlackRock will invest in future. Uh, I have tested this idea with some influential people and said that the uh, attention move away from stakeholders only to the environment now. And they assured me that uh, the environmental uh, focus now, different from some of his previous letters, is just as part of a broader uh, move away from a, sh a purely uh, a shareholder primacy model. So uh, in uh, the uh, British Academy's uh, summit after they've uh, uh, released their report uh, on the purpose of the corporation, they've put it very well, the impact of COVID-19 now. In 2020, we are all living through a crisis few could have anticipated. Uh, COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic has exaggerated the fault lines across society. Business is no exceptions and the crisis is shining new light on the issues that have been driving the shift to purposeful business in recent years. So, is this a clear acknowledgement that in the past, the drive of businesses were purposeless? Well, I don't think it was. I think it was very purposeful, but the purpose was profit maximization for the shareholders and how and whether we can move away from that and how it's going to happen. That's a challenge for us and probably for the next generation. I always tell my students, it will probably be their problem to solve. Uh, I'm not uh, intelligent enough to do that. And I think many people far more uh, competent and uh, intelligent than me have been trying to do that and haven't succeeded. Um, some fundamental cracks were revealed uh, once again by uh, Strine and Lund. Um, 
So the problem of uh, shareholders grabbing everything through uh, dividend payments and uh, share buybacks is not something that I try to uh, uh, make a sensa uh, sensational. It's, it's, it's very much based on uh, proof. So at the same time, American corporations weakened the traditional gain sharing between workers and stockholders that character, uh, characterize the post-World uh, Two era. During that period, when corporate profits went up, workers shared equally in, that, in the gains. Not anymore. I think that's a short sentence. Uh, uh, he says a lot. Um, I think that you would probably recognize the older generation, the Adams family. I think that they could be described as probably a little bit of a screwed up family. And uh, Bruce uh, McEwen um, uh, referred to the article by Leo Strine and said, Leo Strine has a few thoughts on how we screwed up corporate governance. So um, just something on the lighter note. Um, that uh, there are interesting views regarding this. So uh, he also quotes a few other interesting things. If you really want to have a more in-depth analysis of uh, uh, Strines' views on how you can change uh, corporate law, uh, focusing on uh, including uh, uh, employees, read this more academic analysis that he wrote before COVID-19, where he focuses on workers and employees, fair gain sharing between employees and shareholders, um, and then uh, also a more fundamental article towards a fair sustainability. All right, now for the last 15 minutes, I would like to focus on uh, disclosure of and reporting on non-financial matters. Um, this is a very uh, important uh, issue and I'm, I have worked and I'm still working very closely with uh, Professor Mervyn King and uh, John Stanhope in Australia and uh, a person who's very uh, much involved in this at our university, uh, Michael Bray. Uh, and Deakin University was the first university who in actual fact did uh, uh, integrated reporting and uh, Michael is very much involved in that part and also John Stanhope. Um, but let's just see, and now I want the people who specializes in corporate reporting to really think very carefully and concentrate on the statements that I'm making. So please just analyze my statements and, and ask yourself uh, whether I'm right or not. So I'm uh, uh, summarizing what the disclosure and reporting principles are. So I say the arrangements regarding reporting on and disclosure of financial and non-financial matters are based on a globally agreed set of principles and disclosure requirements. Secondly, clear and basic principles apply to ensure that investors can easily make informed decisions based on clear reports, especially by all corporations listed on the world's securities exchanges. Corporations reports on financial and non-financial matters are based on standardized aims and objectives, including materiality and reliability of all disclosed information. Globally agreed categories of reporting, which assist investors with easy comparability or comparability uh, in their investment decisions. Very specific uh, goal, a very specific goal is to make a disclosed information easily accessible to and digestible to all corporate stakeholders. And then finally, there are almost universal agreement amongst legislatures, le regulators, and well, et, et cetera, task force, uh, established business forums, high level groups of experts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera regarding financial and non-financial disclosure and reporting standards. All right. So I know that you have reflected very carefully about this and, and now I want you to, to think about this particular uh, uh, image that I, I, I've bought all the images that I use here so to overcome any copyright issues. So I, I find this very powerful and just want to disclose now that all the above statements are to a large extent misleading and deceptive. If you start with the ones that we can read regarding information that's disclosed, useless, 
misleading while ser more serious? Uh, what's the right information that where that is where we should sit? Irrelevant, unimportant, unverified, futile, pointless, not necessary, uh, hopeless, uh, inadequate, uh, deceptive, and now we start to lose a uh, thread of the other words as we go into uh, uh, over the horizon there. So here's just a summary of the organizations and bodies that's involved in uh, uh, financial and uh, corporate governance reporting. Uh, I will reveal to you the number 55 in a minute, but there's the, the, the picture generally. And I have not spent, I'm, it's not comprehensive. I've, I've, I haven't had the time to really analyze and look at every single body in every country all of you involved in this area will know that there are many more. So just for the uninformed, I've given you the names of the abbreviations. I thought of testing people involved in this area uh, to tell me what all the abbreviations stand for. That could be a multiple choice question or short answer question for one of, for my students in one or, or other test, but I won't do that to you tonight uh, or today rather. Uh, there are some of the abbreviations of the most influential bodies. So in uh, September, 2020, some of the organization, uh, organizations and bodies uh, issued a joint statement of the intent to collaborate and work together. So a step caused by COVID-19 to say, we need to do something, we need to simplify matters. And then uh, only in November, 2020, uh, the I I IIRC and the SASB decided in July this year, June or July to merge into a new body uh, called the Value Reporting Forum. Uh, something that I know some people and I, I'm sure uh, Professor Mervyn King will uh, have uh, will have had a huge part in and uh, very excited about. So eventually uh, you would know that the other two organizations will disappear and then the collaboration will happen uh, with the VRF. But there's no uh, merging with the other organizations, even though the, uh, the September uh, 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 report that came out. So I really think it's fantastic that the, the, the aims are for simplification, uh, the VRF uh, aims, directly response to calls for global investors and corporations to simplify. This merger demonstrates momentum towards simplifying creating incredible momentum towards simplifying the corporate reporting landscape. A vision for comprehensive, I've added simplified corporate reporting system. So it's COVID-19 in actual fact that caused all of this. So Milton Friedman was right. Only a crisis, actual or perceived procedures real, uh, pro uh, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the action that are taken depend on ideas that are lying around. These organizations, they were there for many years. Now, suddenly we realize the reality of things. So I thought because I've mentioned my, uh, my daughter-in-law, I must use a photo of my own son, uh, Armand or Monty as he's known. Uh, and I am going just to show you visually, uh, I will come back to this photo. But uh, the next eight slides, just to show you, I've got 10 minutes I see, and I'm happy that I will be able to take you for everything. Uh, purely to illustrate the landscape uh, that we are in the process, or not we, the organizations involved, that they would like to simplify. Here we have the uh, really seriously uh, fantastic initiative of integrated reporting. Apart from that, we've got the sustainability and accounting standards boards uh, reporting framework. I know it's impossible for people not familiar with this to take this in in a few seconds, but just to overwhelm you even more, it's not all, uh, the global uh, reporting initiative and the SASB framework summarized in one of the uh, statements of collaboration. Then we have all the organizations and in context of the general accepted accounting principles. 
it's not the end. Uh, we've got uh, the another uh, chart here or table explaining the broader uh, context of uh, all the issues involved. And um, then on top of all of this, the universally topic uh, disclosures, sustainability disclosure standards, and just to give you an overview. And, and then it's not the end. We've got the international financial reporting standards. We've got the task force on climate related financial disclosure. Um, and then all of this, I would guess, would aim at trying to promote the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. How can you reach a goal if you don't know how, what measurements you need to use to measure whether you've achieved a goal. And that measurement can only be done if you've got information available, information on non-financial issues and matters that's reported very widely in order to form a, 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 an informed opinion whether the goals have been achieved. So are we now leaving the stormy waters behind and heading towards calm waters? And I think this picture of uh, Armand uh, sort of depicts very well the stormy waters that we have and then the hopefully calmer waters ahead of us. Uh, whether this is going to happen, an open question. Um, I really like the intentions that's been expressed for simplification and to get rid of um, the complexities, but what's the problem? Why did the merger that took place, uh, why didn't it involve some of the other organizations? I don't know. Uh, I've just played uh, sort of really uh, uh, devil's advocate here and wonder whether it's not vested interests. Could it be big egos? Could it be the tax of war amongst the various organizations and institutions and task force? Or, or is it a combination of all of it? I'm not judging this, but uh, if the shoe fits, uh, you will probably be annoyed by what I said before or uh, on the last slide. Is there flickering of hope in all of this? That's a question that I really want to ask you. Are we just experiencing a per perpetuation of the complexity and the distraction of the more fundamental issues? I find this image incredibly powerful. Uh, take a moment and look what's happening here. You've got the vagueness and the fogginess of, and the confusion there of a crowd. And you've got a, a person who's distracting the attention of another person with the person putting his hand in the pocket of the person whose attention is distracted. I, I really, the more I look at this particular image, the more I realize we have been in this situation probably for a very long time. The distraction of our attention, making us look away from the bigger problem, and then who gains from it? The person who's the pickpocketer. So uh, uh, I have written a very short piece in 2016, uh, just a note, and I said, and I argued forcefully that disclosure of non-financial information is a powerful corporate governance tool. Um, now in 2021, I started to realize that it's only a powerful tool if it is based on simplified mandatory disclosure with materiality and reliability of information as core objective. And I know now some of you will really be up in arms and say, ah, oh, not more regulation, not more legislation. Yes, people have been saying that for the last 50 years and have we achieved anything without forcing people to do things? Would all the atrocities, the abuses, the misuses have been uncovered if it wasn't for uh, the Heinz Royal Commission, if it wasn't for COVID-19? So I hope you do not blame me for being a bit of a skeptic about the real impact of soft law. 
Uh, I also pick this image very, very carefully, and I think it's also very powerful. And I, I really think we need to start to think about far more fundamental rethinking of our corporate law and corporate governance models. Uh, this has been overdue for a very long time, uh, long before COVID-19. We all know that, but the forces and the powers and the power of, of money, uh, the, 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 the economies uh, and corporations and uh, conglomerates and multinationals that's stronger than uh, governments that's where the power is. We know that. And change will be almost impossible unless we start to open our minds and realize what the larger consequences are of all of this. So, uh, however, COVID-19 exposed the large crack in this case or uh, of the, car uh, the current shareholder primacy. And many more will fall into the crack. Yes, there, there's a few that's that's running ahead, that's, that's safe. They don't need to jump over the cliff or well, over the crack rather, uh, but there's a lot of people that's going to fall over the cliff. So we need to start to get serious about our consideration of what the differences are and what's really going to save this planet. The shareholder capitalism, or an inclusive capitalism model. So I will end my slide by spending three minutes on uh, the approach by the King Report in South Africa, which I think is excellent. And in, in South Africa, the King Report and the Corporate Governance Code has got the, got the intention of courts and they sort of indirectly enforce the principles. So the position taken in King 4 is that Directors owe their duties to the company and the company alone, as a company is a separate legal entity from the moment it is registered until it is deregistered. The company is represented by several interests, and these include an interest of shareholders, employees, customers, the community, and the environment. Thus, requiring directors to act in good faith in the interest of the company cannot nowadays mean anything other than a blend of all these interests. But first and foremost, they must act in the best interest of the company as a separate legal entity. An interest that may be primary at one particular point in time in the company's existence may well become secondary at a later stage. And uh, can yes, somewhere there's uh, somebody's microphone on now. If you could perhaps try and mute that, Jessica, that would be great. So I've uh, done an animation here. So there you've got the shareholders. If we see the company as a separate legal entity, I think this is how you will put the stakeholders within it at times. And then you have the directors owing their duties uh, towards uh, the company as a separate legal entity. And now just, take a moment to see the animations here, how the various interests can vary at times. Sometimes the shareholders are primary, then the clients, but the directors need to ask the question, whenever we focus on a particular interest, is it in the best interest of the corporation or the company as a separate legal entity? And then some of the interests may become secondary uh, and others primary and uh, so things go on and on and on. I have used the analogy of a merry-go-round merry as well. The horse is going up and down representing various stakeholders. And if we look at this model, and this is my second last slide, and we put this absolutely fantastic concept of integrated reporting in the heart of everything, then I think we probably with the refinement of other organizations and institutions would get back to a situation where non-financial information and reporting is indeed a powerful corporate governance tool. So finally, uh, as far as part one is concerned, the limited liability company resulted in wealth for many, 
but cause suffering for billions and is busy to destroy our planet, something needs to be done. Part two, the all-inclusive shareholder theory of the corporation is gaining momentum like in no other time in history. And it is to be hoped that COVID-19 provided the crisis needed to ensure a fundamental rethink of our corporate law and corporate governance models. And then finally, reporting on, disclo on and disclosure of non-financial information can be a powerful corporate governance tool, but the complexity and divergent approaches currently makes it basically a useless tool. Jessica, I'm sorry, but I think I went over one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you.